3, verse 23 is where we left off. Let's review that verse. Mark 3, 23. And he, meaning Jesus, called them, meaning the scribes down from Jerusalem, mentioned in the previous verse, Jesus called the scribes unto him, unto Jesus, and said unto them, the scribes, in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? We talked about how Satan uh, was used once earlier in Mark, back in chapter 1, where Satan tempted Jesus unsuccessfully to sin. Uh, it'll also occur down in verse 26, where Jesus continues talking and calls the devil Satan. Uh, and it'll occur also later on in the book of Mark. But uh, it is the devil. It is the serpent of Genesis 1, or I mean Genesis 3, and uh, Revelation 20. So all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the devil is there. He is the big enemy of God and man. And uh, Jesus uses the word here instead of the word that the scribes used, Beelzebub, in verse 22. We talked about what Beelzebub means, but this shows that they're one and the same. It goes by different names, but the same person. Well, Jesus knew... He heard, and of course, being God, he knows everything. He knew what the scribes and Pharisees were accusing him of, being in league with the devil. So he uh, calls them unto himself for a special meeting. We have every reason to believe that this was a public meeting. But Jesus takes the offensive here, not the defensive. Uh, He doesn't wait for the Pharisees to come to him. He calls them unto himself in this case. This is an unusual proceeding on Jesus' part, but it shows how serious the charge is that he would call them unto him. Just how serious it is, we will see in verses 28 and 29. And uh, one imagines what the Jewish authorities must have been thinking to have Jesus actually call them to come and talk to them. So uh, we feel it must have been a public meeting with many witnesses of the people standing by to hear what was about to happen. Uh, Think of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, I guess. Well, Jesus starts the conversation out by asking a question, which he usually does. How can Satan cast out Satan? He wants to engage people's thinking by asking them a question. And... How can Satan cast out Satan? Uh, This is what Jesus had been doing. He'd been casting out demons, which is uh, Satan's minions. The evil spirits that Jesus had been casting out were evil angels that had fallen from heaven after rebelling against God under the leadership of Satan himself. As the, as the uh, scribes said in verse 22, he is the prince of the devils. So, uh, to cast out the devils is to cast out Satan himself, is what Jesus said. How can Satan cast out Satan? Because he is their leader. He is their Prince. Now, the scribes and Pharisees were considered the most learned of men in all of Judaism. They were the experts, the theologians, the doctors of theology, we would call them today. And yet Jesus is kind of, in a way, ridiculing them here. If you're so wise, if you're so wise... Uh, you should be able to see how ridiculous this assertion is that you're making against me. Which is another good point to have a public meeting. 
That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and that that uh, this is this is really a foolish and ridiculous concept that Satan is fighting against himself. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in regard to this public meeting, that brings to mind, you know, back in the Reformation, the uh, the Catholic Church under the Pope really hated the Lutherans hated Luther and hated the Lutherans because of the same reason that the Pharisees hated Jesus. Uh, Luther was shining the light of God's word upon all the, the lies and errors of the, of the church, the established church that, that the Pope and the bishops and archbishops and all those Catholic theologians and so forth were, uh, they were so afraid of the truth and so they didn't want to further Jesus, Luther's message, Luther's writings, to get out. That was their way of fighting him. Keep it secret. Don't let it get out, what he's writing. Uh, those who are in darkness hate the light. And... Um, so, uh, one of the big turning points in the Reformation was the Diet of Augsburg. The emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Charles, Emperor Charles, of course, he was a Catholic and he, he was blessed by the Pope and everything. In some ways... He was under the Pope, in some ways he wasn't. He was the governmental leader, but um, the, the church taught that uh, he was only the governmental leader because God made him that, and the church said so. So he, he had this, this uh, connection to the church. Well, he called the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. He said, I want... I want to hear what these Lutherans have to say. I want to meet them personally. I want to hear them. Uh, why they are causing this division in the church. Why, why the problems in the church. And, and, and Charles wasn't a theologian. Charles wasn't a, a, a church man per se. He was a politician. And his goal was to just keep the empire together keep peace and harmony in the empire, especially since they were being attacked on their southeastern border by the Muslim Turks. So his kingdom was under attack by non-Christians. And the last thing he wanted was a division in his own kingdom. He wanted a united front to fight off the Turks. So he calls this, uh, this diet in Augsburg to try to reconcile the two religious differences, the two parties, the Lutherans and the Catholics. Philip Melanchthon, who you've probably heard of, was Luther's uh, main writer at that time, Luther's right arm, you might say. And Melanchthon was in charge of all of the Lutheran theologians who were going to go to Augsburg, Germany, uh, in the spring of 1530, and present the Lutheran position. And they spent months in advance writing it uh, and improving it and correcting it and making it clear and, you know, put their best foot forward at Augsburg in front of the emperor because what the emperor said was very important. Uh, you don't want the government against you in addition to the church. So... They saw this as a great opportunity. Certainly Luther did. Luther himself didn't go. But uh, he was in constant contact by letters with these men like Melanchthon. And uh, it went on for several days there in Augsburg. And it came a point where uh, the emperor himself was there. 
And he, he listened personally to the presentation of the Lutherans. And right at the beginning of the proceedings, the Lutherans requested that the windows of the building be open. Why? So what they, they're saying they can get out. That's right. Yeah, see, and the Catholics didn't want that. They wanted this to be public. And there was, there was lots of people gathered outside the building wanting to see what goes on. This is, this is big stuff. It's big news. And so there was probably literally thousands of people standing around outside the building where this was taking place, and they opened all the windows. And uh, then Langton got up to read what has now come to be called the Augsburg Confession, which is one of the documents in the Book of Concord, which contains all of the Lutheran confessions. If if you call yourself a Lutheran, you, you have to subscribe to the Book of Concord, of 1580, which contains the Augsburg Confession and other Lutheran documents of that era. So this is the first one. This was the big one. And the Lutherans were very wise in that they wanted the windows open, and, and, and Melanchthon just spoke it with a loud voice so that everybody outside could hear it. He was speaking to them as much as he was speaking to the emperor. And the emperor was very sympathetic to it. When he heard, he said, you know, this sounds good. They've backed this all up with the Bible, and I can't find anything wrong with it. I don't know why the Catholics had a problem with it. I don't know why the Pope has a problem with it. Uh, Let me hear the other side. And so one of their, uh, one of the ones, one theologians that the Pope sent up there was named Eck. One was called Faber, and one was Eck. Eck was the big one, and he was a hateful man. And he, uh, he and the others, uh, they didn't like this, the, the whole format of this thing. Like, we shouldn't have to defend our position. We shouldn't have to counteract their, their position. We came up here simply to force these Lutherans back to the fold. And we want the king, the emperor, to just force them back by, by force. This has already worked before. We either threaten them with death or they come back. Well, the emperor wouldn't do it. And even um, some of the Catholics said, hey, this, this, this is good stuff. This, this Augsburg Confession, this, this is good. <laughs> this is a breath of fresh air. This is a beam of, of light in the church. And a lot of them were persuaded, but they were down you know, lower than the, than the Pope and the higher-ups. Well, uh, because the Lutherans made it public, uh, the emperor, Charles, kind of sided with them. So it's, no, I'm not going to cut anybody's head off over this. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to play to the public, to get, uh, to get public sentiment on your side. And uh, I, I think of that when I think of this meeting with Jesus and the, uh, the scribes, I'm pretty sure it was public. Right, and he, obviously, you can see Jesus would want it to be because there's so many wrong rumors running around about him. Yeah. You know, that it hurts his you know, spreading of the, of the true word. That's right. Yeah, and it's, they didn't have printing presses then, so he couldn't print it. You know, there were, so, there were copies and copies, handwritten copies of the Bible. And there might have been a few handwritten copies of some things Jesus has said, we don't know. But it was pretty much word of mouth. Uh, and uh, that's why Jesus talked about, you know, uh, confess me before men, be my witnesses, testify of me before men. The only way they could do it back then was by speaking it to other people. So uh, uh, Jesus uh, had a lot of public support, and uh, he wanted to keep that going with this kind of a meeting. You know, when the Augsburg Confession was read to the governor or the emperor there, he, did he have a position? I know you said he wanted to hear their Lutheran argument. Was he already leaning towards? 
that point, do you know? I think he probably was simply because he was under the Pope. Sure. Uh, he wanted the Pope's blessing. Uh, but his main concern was political. He wanted to keep the kingdom united. And he, he went into the Augsburg Confession with this attitude of, uh, can't we all just get along? Uh, you can believe what you want to believe, and they can believe what they want to believe, and everybody be happy. Why do we all have to be forced into this one church? So he was almost kind of saying religious freedom. And he kind of came out of it with that attitude, uh, resisting the pressure of the Pope's representatives. Did the Catholic Church or the Pope then you know, uh, force this emperor or governor out of his position somehow? Did no, okay. no. The Lutherans also had several of the princes, what were called the estates, uh, in Germany on their side. And this is part of the Holy Roman Empire, which was right under the emperor. Uh, I guess it'd be like the president, and then you had the governors in our country. Well, these governors, several of them were on the side of the Lutherans by then. So he had to deal with them, too, politically. And he just needed a united kingdom to fight the Muslims. So God used the Muslims to kind of further the Reformation. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he was, um, he was just more of a politician than a theologian, but he wasn't totally ignorant of the Bible either. Sure. Uh, and he found nothing wrong with the Lutheran confession, with the, uh, Augsburg confession. But, but he was kind of like, uh, where the United States ended up when it was formed, you know, in 17, the 1780s. Uh, and the Constitution of the United States was written for religious freedom in the First Amendment, uh, he, he wanted the same thing in his empire. Why should we just force one religion, one church on everybody? Can't we have different views, different opinions, even different beliefs, and get along? So he was kind of a pioneer in that regard. And that's the way he kind of came down. He said, I'm not going to cut these guys' heads off. I'm not saying whose side I'm on. I'm taking sides. I'm just saying I'm not going to punish anybody here. Right, right. <laughs> kind of a political thing, you know. It is because then he has governors under mm-hmm. him that yeah. wants to have their backing. Uh-huh, right. yeah. All right. But it's just neat to, you know, how God's word again spread out. You just can't find fault in it. I mean, those who are hard, hard against it well. That's right, yeah, yeah, that because they had a, uh, kind of a, a worldly axe to grind, right, right. Uh, like the scribes here. Right. Uh, they had authority and power and prestige and standing in the world, and they didn't want to lose that. Right. And they saw this as a threat, just as the scribes and Pharisees saw Jesus as a threat. As long as you were willing to put yourself under the authority of the Pope and his hierarchy, you're okay. Just don't rock the boat. There's a price high. You can believe whatever you want to believe. Just don't publicly express it if it goes against our views. That, that could be. Yeah, just keep it to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> just put money in the offering, and we're okay. And, and one more little piece on that. Uh, the Lutherans, at first, you know, Luther didn't want to start a new church. He just hoped that the, the Pope and them would, would sit down and be reasonable. And let's discuss this. Let's open the Bibles and see what the Bible says and see how we've gotten off the track with some of these things. They would have none of that. And it took about 10 years for Luther to come to the realization, well, that ain't going to work. <laughs> uh, they're not going to be reformed. Uh, so the best he hoped for them was a new church, an Orthodox church that could exist side by side with the Pope's church. Sure. By the time of Augsburg, that was the Lutheran's hope. We're not going to convince these people. We're not going to change these people. Uh, Best we can hope for is they leave us alone and we can start our own churches. So that's what's going on. We have this public meeting between Jesus and his 
about enemies uh, uh, who are spreading this vicious lie about Jesus that he is in league with Satan. And he starts off by saying, isn't this ridiculous? You're, you're saying that Satan is against Satan? In verse 23, surely you, you, learned, you most learned of men can see how contradictory this is, how illogical this is. I mean, even the common people standing around, they can see it. Why would Satan be in me and then send me out to cast out his own demons? This is foolishness. That's what, in effect, he's saying by asking that question. And as I pointed out before, this would be like a general of an army in a battle ordering the guns turned on his own soldiers, start fighting each other. Well, who'd win that battle? (laughs) Obviously, the opponent would win that one. So why would Satan commit suicide, is what he's saying here. No, Satan's far too smart to destroy his own kingdom. He wants to extend and expand his kingdom, not destroy it. Verse 24. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Well, remember it said in verse 23, he spoke unto them in parables. Well, here comes the parables. First parable, he talks about a kingdom, a country, a nation. Uh, And he's going to use another parable in verse 27, I mean verse 25, and if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And in verse 27, here's another parable, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. All three of those are parables. Now, what is a parable? Well, Jesus liked to use parables a lot. And a parable is simply a comparison. Say, here's something you're familiar with, and let's compare it to something you're not familiar with. Because they're they're almost exactly the same. Okay? That's what a parable is. It's a comparison. Uh, We might use other words. It's an illustration. Uh, Good preachers use illustrations to illustrate points. They'll say, here's, here's something that happened in history. Or imagine a story like this. It's kind of like what I'm trying to teach you from the Bible today. We call them illustrations. And uh, I know when I hear illustrations, my ears perk up a little bit more than if I'm just hearing sentences. Because everybody likes a story. Why? Because stories are entertaining. And Jesus knew that. Uh, some wise man once said, people want to be entertained, not enlightened. <laughs> and uh, that's why a lot of these mega churches, it's just entertainment. They know that's what attracts people. If you tell them, come to our church, we will enlighten you, people say, eh, I don't need to be enlightened. But if they say, come to, come to our church because we've got a band, a band, a plan today, then they're more likely to go. Well, a parable is kind of like that. It's it's an entertainment. It's a, it's a story. And people just like stories. It helps them to understand more difficult concepts. Another word that is used in uh, your study of English is analogy or simile or allegory. It's all the same thing. Uh, Aesop's fables is just a bunch of allegories, for example. So it's usually in a story form. It can be a very, very short story, like here in verse uh, 24. There's a story in there, but it's a very short story. Now, in the book of Mark, this is the first parable that Jesus tells. Uh, And we're not saying it's the first parable he told, but in the book of Mark, it's the first one that's recorded. The closest thing that Jesus uses to a parable so far is if you go back to chapter 2, he said in chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus heard it. He said to him, 
They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Okay, in a way, that's kind of a parable. But then he, he comes and he says immediately what he means by that. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And the disciples of John and the Pharisees used to uh, fast. And they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. So that's kind of a parable, kind of a comparison. Verse 21, no man soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it in, uh, that filled it up, taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. It's kind of a parable. Verse 22, no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine burst, doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. Okay, so all of those you could kind of consider like parables. But uh, the first use of the word is in chapter 3, verse 23, where it says that Jesus spoke unto them in parables. And then we have these parables that we noted a moment ago following. So here he begins the parable in verse 24, and if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So he, he uses the analogy of a kingdom with a king and all of his subjects. Now, as we talked about King uh, Charles, the Holy Roman Emperor, what's his main concern? Outside of keeping his own, king, his own kingship, Keeping it together, yeah. And the last thing he wanted to do was see it divided between the Lutherans and the Catholics, or the Papists, or the Romanists, as they were called back then. Uh, the main thing that the kingdom wants to do is keep his kingdom united under him and peaceful. Okay? Uh, and so Jesus says, okay, you've brought up the subject. You say, in verse 22... The prince of the devils casteth he out devils. Well, the prince brings in the concept of kingdom because the prince is like the king. So he's in effect calling, uh, they were calling uh, the devil a prince or a king and all of the other devils his subjects. That's his kingdom, the devil and the devils. So he uses their words, if a kingdom, or you could even say, if you want to use the exact word, a princedom, uh, is divided. If Satan's kingdom is divided, how can it stand? How can the ruler of a kingdom be divided from his own kingdom? How can he fight against himself? The king is the kingdom. If he doesn't have a kingdom, he's not a king. And if he starts killing his own people, he's killing his own kingdom. What king would do that? Only if the subject rebelled and was no longer part of his kingdom or didn't want to be part of his kingdom. So Jesus is trying to reason with them in terms of a parable here. If Satan... Or any king, any king, any prince of a kingdom were to keep that up, keep killing off his own subjects, what would be the end of it? Yeah, his kingdom would certainly be wrecked. He'd wreck his own kingdom. As he says at the end of verse 26, it would have an end. He'd be ending his own kingdom. So, if what the, the logical 
rational conclusion of this logic is, if I am serving Satan and attacking his kingdom, if, if that's the case, then you would start to see Satan's kingdom what? Fall apart. Are you seeing that, folks? Is Satan's kingdom crumbling before your very eyes? Yeah. So, you see, it's not reasonable what they are telling about me. With their, this rumor they're spreading. It's obvious Satan is alive and well. So what they are suggesting isn't happening. No king would be so foolish to permit divisions in the midst of his own armies. If you have a rebel in your own army who is killing your own men, what would you do? You'd get rid of that rebel. Wouldn't encourage him. So Jesus is saying this is just common sense, and that's what all of his parables are. They're just common sense. It's logical, it's reasonable, is what he's saying in all of his parables. And he's showing that, in this case, the scribes are simply being illogical and nonsensical by spreading this rumor about me. They're not using common sense here. And anybody that believes this is not using common sense either. Then he goes down to verse 25. And, here's another one, another comparison. If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. What's a house? Is he talking about the building itself? No, he's talking about a family here. A family that lives together under one roof. A family. Calls it a house. We would call it a household. Uh, If the family members of of the family of the house are divided and they are turning on one another and destroying one another, how long would that family go on? It cannot stand. If the family is divided and they destroy one another, the family would soon cease to be a family. Do we have a a very simple case of where a house would divide? Very, very common today. What do we call it? Divorce. Divorce. There's a house divided. And what happens to that house? It falls apart. It cannot stand. Yeah. Um, What happens when the sixth commandment is violated? Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's divorce. And uh, the Eighth Commandment shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Anyway, we see this when children do not honor their parents. That's the Fourth Commandment. That's a house divided, isn't it? So, I mean, it's a common thing that Jesus uses as an example here. What happens to a family when the children do not honor their parents? The family is divided. It's not at peace anymore. It's not a happy house anymore. Uh, Anytime you violate God's commandments, that leads to unhappiness. If the family, if the house is to be happy and at peace, all in the house must be of the same mind. 
They must all be working toward the same ends. They must all be loving one another and helping one another. Then the house will stand. This is a truth we can all identify with. Jesus likes to use these examples. Well, the same goes for the church. Just got back from the convention. It's it's like a house or a kingdom, our church body. And if a church is to be happy and at peace, it must be what? It must be united. It can't be divided. If you have a divided church, it cannot stand. And that's why at the convention, Ben, there were those of us who said, let's have an end to this division. Let's all get united and say, this is our teaching, this is a doctrine based on Romans 16, 17, and 18. Wells and L's do not agree with us. Why would we want to join with them and have a house divided with them? So let's be united and not unite with them. Because a house divided against itself, Jesus said, that house cannot stand. And we see it within a congregation also. Unity of doctrine. Unity of doctrine. Same teaching. Unity of practice among all the members is God's will for his church. Uh, Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Now, 1 Corinthians comes right after what? Romans. What's the last chapter of Romans? Yeah, yeah, Mark. uh, The last chapter of Romans is Romans 16. So let's go to Romans 16, 17, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 1. So these are two chapters back to back in the Bible. And of course, uh, Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What's he calling for there? Unity of doctrine and practice. Jump right over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, right across the page. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Isn't that the same thing? Yeah. Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. Going back to Mark 3. If it's true of families, if it's true of churches, if it's true of kingdoms, it's certainly true of Satan's kingdom. Why would he want division within his own kingdom? Why would he send me out to destroy his devils? Makes no sense. Takes us to verse 26. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. So, why would Satan do this? Scribes, can you give us a reason why he would do this? (laughs) Why would Satan send me out to destroy his kingdom? I'd be helping. I'm his enemy. God is his enemy. Enemy. God wants to destroy his kingdom. I've come to destroy the works of the devil. I guess I wonder if they kept silent and didn't reply. And we don't know. But. Yeah, we're not told here. But some might say, well, maybe, maybe Satan is doing this as a ploy. Maybe he's doing this as a trick. Maybe he's doing it as a ruse. Okay? 
a deception to gain other evil purposes. Maybe he's saying to himself, I can hurt Jesus if I allow him to cast out my devils. Because then I can accuse him of this. And that'll destroy Jesus. Maybe he's got a real trick up his sleeve like that, right? So he would tell his devils, when Jesus casts you out, go ahead and leave. Go ahead and be cast out uh, of the possessed human being on the orders of Jesus. Then you have to ask the question of the, of the scribes. Okay, so Satan's telling his own soldiers, obey the enemy. Obey Jesus when he casts you out of a, deem, of a possessed person. I ask, what would such a ruse gain? What would Satan gain by that? What purpose would Satan attain beyond the terrible one that he has already attained by demonical possession? Doesn't he want to possess more people? Not less? So what does he gain if he allows Jesus to do this? Again, such an argument is illogical. No, if Satan orders his demons to abandon a possessed person, who loses? Satan loses, and who wins? Yeah, God wins. Satan only loses, he gains nothing by that. Now, Satan is far too wily and far too clever to bring harm upon himself and destroy his own kingdom. Is Jesus' parabolic logic. Okay, that brings us to the 10 o'clock hour, so that's a good place to stop because uh, now Jesus shifts gears into verse 27. There's another way for a kingdom to fall, and that's by outward forces. It will certainly fall if it's divided inwardly. But there's another way for a kingdom to fall, and that's by an outward force. And that's where Jesus uses a parable in 27. Shall we close with the benediction? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen.